We began two weeks ago with pietas. Remember that, that Latin word, piety? And the idea of true piety is not that we shake and quake or quote a lot of Bible verses, but the idea of piety is that everything in the Christian's life begins with and is rooted in the sovereign God. Everything begins with and is rooted in the sovereign God. And that, therefore, includes marriage and family. And so that Sunday, we looked at Ephesians 5 and 6, and we saw that the marriage of the husband and the wife is like the marriage of Christ and the church. You can't just have a marriage over here off to the side and ignore the idea of Jesus' marriage to the church. His marriage to the church must parallel the marriage of the husband and the wife. And we saw that also in Ephesians 6, to raise and discipline your children in the Lord. And so I don't just raise my children, I raise them in the Lord. And that is true piety. That is true pietas. Well, then last week said, well, if that is true, that everything is, is rooted in, if everything is rooted in the Lord, then what does that mean in terms of understanding marriage as well as singleness? And took some time last week and the week before also to focus in on singleness and to say that, that it means that I understand that my life is unique. The marriage went to Genesis 2. The marriage is unique. It's not the result. Remember I talked last week about, about evolutionary, uh, social evolution, that, that somehow way back, thousands of years ago, uh, people carrying around clubs and with loincloths found it better to uh, get together in their cave with just one man and one woman, uh, and, that, and that is not necessarily what marriage, and we said, no, 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 marriage is created by God, Genesis 2, the husband and the wife, one flesh, and then that we are created to pass on to the next generation the model, the values that we have incorporated into our marriages or into our single lives, pass those on to the next generation. And we looked at, at Psalm 78, that who we are as families, as marriages, as single people, that 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 is something that is carried on then to the next generation. And I need to keep that in mind because I am not an island. I am not a soul individual. I, we are not a soul marriage, but we are individuals and marriages that are looking ahead to our children, our grandchildren, to the next generation. Well, if all of that is true, which it is, based on these Bible passages and true piety, then how do, I, how do I understand that in a very practical way? If I'm going to uh, understand my marriage or my singleness in a biblical way, what do I do? What are some practical ways to do it? And then to, to pass that by example and by teaching on to that next generation. Well, I need to have a plan. I need to think about it, and I need to design a plan. And it's not too late. If you're in your 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, and you've got kids, grandkids, and even great-grandkids, out there, it's never too late to formulate some kind of a plan. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be reading this morning from the book of Proverbs. If you like to follow along in your Bibles, get out the book of Proverbs, because that's going to be the passage, and, um, uh, and I'm going to start in earnest with Proverbs chapter 12, uh, so we're going to get to that in just a moment. But in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 3, it says, by wisdom a house is built. Now, house here doesn't mean the physical structure, even though we need a lot of wisdom to build a physical structure, and there are um, amazing carpenters who know how to do that, and architects. But the idea of house in the Bible is the idea of home, the idea of family. At the end of Psalm 23 that we sang earlier, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
It's not necessarily a structure that has four sides with aluminum siding, uh, but it's the idea of family. And so your house, if you're a single person, is your apartment, perhaps uh, if you share that apartment with someone else. Uh, uh, if you're married, uh, your house is your home where you and your spouse live. If you have children, it's where your children are there with you. Your house is your home. And so it says in Proverbs 24, verse 3, by wisdom a house is built, through understanding it is established. So I need to have wisdom and I need to have understanding as I, as I structure that home and design it in such a way not only that I will fulfill what it is to be created by God, one flesh, but that I will, that I will design, I will plan my home in such a way that I am sending someone, so, something on to the next generation by wisdom. A house is built, and by understanding, it is established. So I, I, I came up with <coughs> practical ideas. And the first one is called Happy Home. There it is, Happy Home. That one of the ways that we pass on a model to the next generation, as well as fulfilling who we are as single people and married people, is to have a happy home. And Proverbs is just full of statements, teachings about having a happy home. Now, I want to start off with some negatives, some negatives out of Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, 12, 18. And by the way, I got a lot of passages from Proverbs if you want these afterwards, if you don't have paper and pen with you, you just let me know and I'll send them to you or email them to you. But uh, Proverbs 12, verse 18 says, Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Reckless words pierce like a sword. Reckless words. What do you say? Last thing at night before going to bed, before going to sleep. What do you say? before you leave the house in the morning. Uh, Proverbs 17, verse 1. Better a dry crust with peace, with peace and quiet, than a house full of feasting with strife. Better a dry crust. Now, hopefully you have more than a dry crust. We're having a ham dinner today, and I'm very thankful for that. But... Better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. Still in chapter 17, verse 19, he who or she, sometimes Proverbs uses the masculine, sometimes the feminine, he who loves a quarrel loves sin. If you are prone to pick fights in your home, in your family, the Bible says you love Sin, that's sin. Proverbs 21, verse 23, 21, 23. He who guards his mouth and his tongue keeps himself from calamity. Guard, guard your mouth and your tongue. And then we come to those... Um, Famous passages. The, uh, I, now, it mentions the wife. This could be the husband, too. But uh, chapter 21, verse 9. Better to live on a corner of the roof than with a quarrelsome wife. <laughs> you know, they had flat roofs back then. If I lived on the corner of my roof, I'd fall off. It's, you know, but, or, or 21, verse 19. Better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and ill-tempered wife or husband. Uh, or like 27 verse 15, 27, 15. Living with that kind of a husband or a wife is like constant dripping on a rainy day. Constant dripping on a rainy day. Now instead, in terms of a happy home, 
Here are some positives. Going to chapter 15, verse 1. A gentle answer turns away wrath. That's very famous. A gentle answer. You don't have to bite. You don't have to snip. A gentle answer turns away wrath. Or 15, verse 30. A cheerful look brings joy to the heart, and good news brings health to the bones. Remember those um, Archie Bunker programs? Maybe you still watch, uh, they're still on those off channels, but Archie and Edith, you know how he would come home every day, he'd come in the front door every day from work and hang up his hat on the, uh, the tree, uh, you know, the coat tree, uh, and she would come running and give him a hug and a kiss and yell, how was your day? Rotten. It was always rotten. It was bad. It was horrible. Well, a cheerful look brings joy to the heart and good news, health to the bone. Or 25 verse 11, a word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. That's famous. Apples of gold. A word aptly spoken. Or 25 verse 17 talks about respecting distance. See, a happy home is not only you're together and you're talking nice to each other, but there's also a respect for distance. You know, going to the man cave or, you know, puttering in the garage for a while. Uh, you don't always have to be together. Sometimes it's, you know, a little bit good to... The light is always happy when I take off in the morning. Okay, Whew. all right. Although, glad to see me come home at the same time because it says in chapter 25, verse 17, seldom... Set foot in your neighbor's house, too much of you, and he will hate you. <laughs> now, we can adapt that to the family. If you're always hanging around your spouse or always hanging around the person you live with, uh, you know, eventually, you know, <clears throat> give me a little space here. But the idea of a happy home, or number two, the second one is what I call finding and forming. Proverbs talks about finding, finding a good wife. The famous Proverbs 31, that's, that's about who, you know, finding a good wife. Who can find a good wife? She is worth far more than rubies. And then chapter 18, verse 22, he who finds a good wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. So it talks about finding. And there's different ways of, of finding a wife or a husband or a, a, a good friend. If you're single, to have a good friend. There's different ways of finding. Some people meet uh, kind of by accident, or they meet at work, or they meet online. There's been more of that lately. But it talks about finding somebody. But once you find that person and get married to them, remember last week I used the example of the tree growing in the middle of the living room? They're always there. Now again, maybe from time to time they're in the man cave or they take off to work, but they're always there for 50 years, for 60 years, for 70 years. They're always there. And some might even be scared of marriage because they're saying, you know, I kind of like this person, but for the next 50 years, they're always there. Well, the, the point is, you not only find the mate, but you also form one another to fit into your, into your capacity to care and to love. So you don't automatically become best friends the first day of marriage, the first day you walk across the threshold into that new apartment, into that new house. It takes time. And sometimes the opening months and, and even years can be a bit bumpy. But, but what people need to do is not only focus on, I found this person, but I'm forming this person, and this person is forming me into the kind of person that will be my best friend. Now, we're always going to have our warts. We're always going to have our, our bumps and bruises. But to form a person into that person who will be, the, but, but, and, and it takes, and we don't have time this morning to get into all of these. I've, I've talked about them before, but it, but it takes, for example, it takes understanding a person's profile, their personality profile. Uh, this is something that the colonels work on when they do uh, marriage counseling, the personality profile. For example, if you have a very structured, detailed person, we call that melancholy. It doesn't mean sad. 
It's a different use of the word melancholy. If, if a melancholy is married to a sanguine, a sanguine is a person who likes people and is a bit disorganized. You, you put those two people together and it takes time for them to form each other into a good union. Or you take two detailed persons, two people who are fussy, detailed, structured, you put them together, well, I'll tell you, it takes time for them to learn how to live together. Or two people that are called choleric. They both want to run the show. You put them together. That takes time. But the thing is to understand how that person is wired and then to form that person and let that person form you into the kind of person that can be that beautiful friendship. It, it also means looking at a person's gifts. How is this person gifted? And how can we then have a division, what I'm going to call a division of labor? There are some men, for example, who think that they have to take care of the money because they're male. Not true. Not true. I've told you before, I tried to take care of the money for one month. And it didn't work. And because she is excellent at taking care of money. So I don't do it has nothing to do with being male or female, or, or who's going to be the cook. Some men are great cooks. In fact, some men are the homemakers. We have those in our church. The wife is the breadwinner in terms of bringing home the paycheck. And that's fine. Uh, and, and, and the important thing is that you recognize the gifts of that person, how they are built, how they are put together, and, and you work together on developing a team. I used to say to my high school class, I used to say, when I come home at 5.30, I expect supper to be ready. And I expect when I open that drawer to have all of the shirts ready to go, clean and folded. And the kids would go, oh, oh that's terrible. Oh, that's terrible. And I said, no, 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 wait a minute. I said, she has chosen to be a homemaker. And I have chosen to go out and get the paychecks. She respects that. I respect the homemaker part. And therefore, she expects the paycheck. I expect the dinner. But it's in terms of what we have developed as a team. And that's what I mean by forming. And so if, you are, if you're watching or here and you're newly married or in a new relationship, it takes time to form and sometimes you have to be brutally honest. Okay, third one. I call just like Jesus. And just like Jesus, and here I'm, I'm going to step away from Proverbs and use John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. For God so loved, loved the world that he gave himself. And the word love there is that famous Greek word agape, agapic love, which doesn't necessarily mean I like you, although that's good, and it doesn't necessarily mean I enjoy you, although that's good, and doesn't necessarily mean I find you compatible, though that's good. What it means is I am committed to be your servant. That's important for some men to understand. You know, we get this Ephesians 5 passage about the husband is head of the wife. Headship. Well, in the Bible, headship means to be a shepherd. If you, if you study, for example, the Old Testament, the kings of the Old Testament were called to be shepherds. The priests, the, the, the spiritual leaders were called to be shepherds. They were called to be servants. And God is really angry with his kings and his priests and his high priests if they fail to be shepherds, if they fail to be servants. And so the idea of being a head, the head of the wife, is not, I run the show here, I'll tell you what to do, I'm in charge, I make the final decision. No, no, no. The idea of headship is, I am here to be your servant. Now, it should go the other way around, too. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, be submissive one to the other. But the idea is that I'm here to serve you. That's where the vows come in, the marriage vows. 
There's going to be some times you don't like the other person, but then you remember, I made vows, and as a Christian, I am called to be a servant to this person. And that doesn't mean that they always have to do it my way or see it my way, but it does mean that we are here to serve one another. And if somebody has arrogance, pride, stubbornness, do it my way or else, my way or the highway, or going back to those earlier passages out of, out of Proverbs about the sharp tongue and, and, and the indecent way to talk, you, you better get with it. That's not Christian. Christian is to be a servant, for God so loved the world that he gave himself, and I am called to love just like Jesus. Well, the fourth and final practical thing that I thought, I've got all these, you know, happy home, it's the way we talk and look, finding and forming, shaping, forming my my friend, my husband, my wife, into that person that can be my best friend, uh, just like Jesus, to be a servant, to give my life to this person as Jesus gave his life to me. The last one is called living towards legacy. Now, this fits in with what we had out of Psalm 78 last week and what I mentioned at the beginning, that I'm always looking to the next generation. It's not just what's important for the here and now, <coughs> But it's also what's important for my children, grandchildren, my nieces, if you're single, nieces, nephews. And, and I, I, I know that as soon as you see legacy and leaving the legacy, we think of things like wills and money and investments and so, and that's, that's important. That is very good. That is very good, of course. And each and every one of us, especially as we get older, should have a will, and, uh, all of that kind of stuff we work out with the attorney and who's going to get the, the diamond necklace and who's going to get the, 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 the dining room outfit and that kind of stuff so that the kids don't fight over it. Uh, so the, yeah, a legacy in that sense, yes. But what I'm talking about is leaving a legacy of reputation, a legacy of example, a... a a, a, a reputation, an example of life and faith. See, our, our, our old grandfather, sometimes he could be a little grumpy, but he was totally committed to the church. Totally committed. He was a servant. And he didn't always like what was going on, and he could get a little grumpy. Uh, and but he was always there. I think of this, this whole mask thing and everything. Uh, in COVID, there are some people who get grumpy over it. They get grumpy. And they get grumpy at the church. Be careful. What kind of message are you sending to your kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids? See, grandpa could be a little grumpy or disagree, but he was there. He was committed. He was committed. No, if our father the same way, he could get a little grumpy too once in a while. But no ifs, ands, or buts about it, you were there. You were committed. There was an example. That was what we grew up with. So was it any accident that we followed suit? Now, it doesn't always happen that way. But where there is an attitude of commitment and love, because we could see, we could see, I, I say sometimes grumpy, but there was, basically there was the love, there was the example towards God, towards Christ, towards being a Christian, towards the church. And, and, and so it says in Proverbs 11, going back to Proverbs again, 11 verse 29, he who brings trouble on his family will inherit only the wind. It brings trouble on the family. So you, you're not going to go to church anymore. Or you're always crabby and, or maybe physical and push people around. Or, or, or you talk with other people about religion. But boy, at home, nothing. You see, you got to be careful. You are sending a message. You're sending a message. 
And we have to leave that legacy. And, and not only in, in terms of faith and, and the church and Christianity, but just in general, to, to, to leave with our children and our grandchildren a legacy of what it is to be a happy family. Remember two weeks ago, I prayed a little clip from an interview with Charles Stanley that he was having with his son, Andy Stanley. Both of them are, are amazing pastors in Atlanta, Georgia. And this is a clip. It's a, it's a great example of how Charles Stanley lived a legacy in terms of how to be that happy family. Watch. Um, we, we took long vacations. In fact, one time, I can't even imagine this. We had an 18-foot travel trailer, 18-foot travel trailer. We went out west for five weeks. Okay, I love my children. I, <laughs> I can't imagine a five-week vacation in an eight, pulling an 18-foot travel, travel trailer. But that's the way you prioritized us. So what was your thinking in all of that? Well, first of all, I wanted to go. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, that might have had something to do yeah, with it. Yeah, that did. And secondly, I wanted to share what I love, the outdoors and the woods and the forest and the glaciers and everything. I wanted to share that with you all. And so as far as the church was concerned, it was more important to me for us to be together, regardless of what people thought. And so I enjoyed it. And what I tried to do is to give you all the experiences that I wish I'd had went by the head of Father and to go to all the places we went. And if you think of all the things that we did, and the one thing I loved about the travel trailer was we were all together. We were very close together. <laughs> it was just 18 But remember feet. this, when we went to Naples, we had the whole beach. That's before they got built up. Police would drive up and down the beach about once a day. We had that whole beach to ourselves, travel trailer. We cook outside. We had a fantastic time. I loved every minute of it. And I figured y'all would never forget it. And we happened to be there at the season that the, that the sand dollars came in. Yep, that and we were year. picking up very small ones, large ones. And those are times in my life that I enjoyed them just as much as you all did. And at that point, I didn't, I didn't care what people thought. But you, well, you should have done this, you should have done that. You know what? You only have one life. These kids are only going to be yours at this age. We're going to live it up in order to enjoy one another. And you have not forgotten it. Yeah. We rented the same cottage for 50 years. And now our kids rent the same cottage. The legacy. It says in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22, a good man or woman, couple, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children and their children. And so in simple practical ways, be it the 18-foot trailer or the cottage or a, 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 a tradition at Christmas, we leave a legacy. We, we pass those values on. And certainly, this idea that we as adults, as a, a, a married couple and as a family are, and this goes back now to where we started, pietas, we are rooted in the Lord. We are rooted in the Lord. It says in Proverbs 14, 26, he who fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for his children it will be a refuge. So when those children recognize that there is that faith, there is that grounding in the Lord, that will send a message how they are to live, not only as children, but then as adults, and pass that on to their children. A final clip, same interview on that theme, the spiritual legacy. Early on, maybe too early, you just consistently said, what would you do or how would you handle that or how would you fix that if I wasn't here? I remember my first traffic ticket. I'd like to say it was my one and only traffic <laughs> ticket, but I remember my first traffic ticket. I did, had not had my driver's license very long. I got pulled over, leaving school. Um, I got home and of course I was scared to death like any teenager. Oh no, what's my dad 
going to do? Is he going to take away the car? Is he going to take away my license? And you probably don't even remember this. So I came in and, you know, apologetically, dad, I, I got pulled over by the police. He gave me a traffic ticket and you didn't get mad. You said, well, uh, you'll have to handle that. And I'm like, well, what do I do? And you said, well, just turn the ticket over. It has all the instructions in the back. And then you just left the room. And suddenly, instead of punishing me, you basically said, if you're, you know, if you're responsible enough to have a driver's license, <laughs> you're responsible enough to figure out what to do with a, a traffic ticket. And you, you didn't punish me. You let the law punish me. And then again, you just put all the decision-making right back in my lap. I don't even know if you remember that. Well, so you kept loving me instead of the policeman. Well, see, this is another really important principle because instead of inserting yourself into the equation, you took my position or you took my side to say, you know what, Andy, I think you're smart enough to figure this out. I think you'll figure out how to pay for the traffic ticket. It's right there on the back of the ticket. You know, good luck. And again, here I am all these years later, I can remember where we were standing in our house in Tucker. So early on, just putting the decision-making pressure, the appropriate pressure on us was extraordinary. And I do think it was an overflow of the fact that you knew, you remember growing up, hey, you, you had to learn those things early. And then one other thing, and you just alluded to it, um, you did a great job uh, intentionally um, P taking, you know, reminding my sister and I, Becky and I, that ultimately we weren't accountable to you anyway, that ultimately we were accountable to God. That's right. And the, way, and the way you taught us that, again, we would ask you a question or not advice, but a, a decision, you know, we had to make. And you would say, have you prayed about it? Have you prayed about it? And that was so frustrating because I'm like, I, I don't need to pray about it. I just need you to help me make the decision. But you consistently said, Ask God and, um, you know, whatever you feel like the Lord wants you to do. The book of Proverbs then has great instruction. With the mouth, the attitude, the look, creating that happy home. And then also, taking that person that I have found to be my friend, my mate, and, and the two of us forming ourselves into that unit. And all the while, being just like Jesus, with the attitude, the mind of a servant, John 3, 16, and being cognizant of the fact that it's not just me, and it's not just the two of us, but it's also the legacy who comes after me that God has given me that responsibility to share, to care, and to pass on.